All right, welcome to a brief little intro on atomic structure and theory. Um, I'm, this is like a shortcut for the Rene McCormick vodcast, so it's just showing you some important parts and the practice problems that are involved, the practice calculations involved in the first eight pages. So you can follow along with that. If you don't have that, then at least it gives you an idea of some important calculations and concepts. May not totally be testable on the AP exam, but totally relevant to a first year college chemistry course. All right, so what you see here is the electromagnetic radiation spectrum, all the way from radio waves over here to gamma rays over here. And if you know about waves, all right, light travels in waves, and the velocity is in meters per second. And so we can say that velocity is wavelength, which is this lambda symbol. Hi. That's wavelength, and then times the frequency, which is nu. Looks like a V, but it's not. So as we'll see a little later, we will use V for velocities. Now I think, you know, especially in different fonts, the nu looks very much like a V, so I will often use a, an italicized F for frequency. So wavelengths are measured in meters, frequency in inverse seconds, so when you multiply those two together, you get velocity, meters per second. Well, all of this electromagnetic radiation travels at the same speed, the speed of light, which is given the symbol C, and C is equal to, as we see here, 3 times 10 to the negative 8, or I'm sorry, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So you do kind of want to have to have an idea of what's going on with this electromagnetic radiation. So you can see on the left hand side, gamma rays have a very high frequency, high energy rays, you know, damaging gamma rays. That means they have a shorter wavelength, shorter distance between wave peaks. Whereas on the opposite end, on the right hand side here, our radio waves have low frequency, low energy, longer wavelengths. And so of this huge spectrum of electromagnetic radiation, we can only see a little part of it, the visible spectrum. And you can see pretty much between 400 and 700 some nanometers is the visible spectrum. And again, the different energies of the different uh, wavelengths of light are kind of important because they'll talk about sometimes the types of energy that we put into an atom or a compound and what we can get back from it or what we can learn from that. So for example, microwaves are very involved with a vibrational energy. So when you put food in the microwave, microwaves are sent towards your food, it causes the water molecules to vibrate more, which increases the temperature of the food. If we shoot like um, visible or ultraviolet light into an, a sample of atoms, we can get the valence electrons to come out. Um, if we shoot in x-rays, we can get electrons that are closer to the nucleus to be ejected. If we shoot gamma rays in, we can bust up the nucleus and get protons and neutrons and alpha particles, etc. And we'll talk about all of those more in depth, but that's why it's kind of important to know that scale of energy. And so if you need a mnemonic device for that, I've got one for you. Ha ha ha. Of course, my name is Victor, right there in the middle, the visible spectrum, right in the center. So from low energy to high energy, radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays. You're welcome, <laughs> whether you use it or not, but that's one way that you can remember the electromagnetic spectrum. So let's look at a sample calculation involving our newfound information. So our red firework color due to emission of light with late wavelengths around 650 nanometers coming from strontium salts. So we want to calculate the frequency of red light with a wavelength of 650 nanometers. So we saw that the speed of light is equal to wavelength times frequency. So you can plug and chug there or rearrange. We could find the frequency of this light by doing the speed of light divided by the wavelength. Now, do you have your calculator, if you have a graphing calculator, you should have the speed of light 
programmed in there, stored. And then you don't have to type it out all the time. You should have Avogadro's number stored in there. Maybe Planck's constant when we get to it here. But you take the speed of light, which is in meters per second, and you have to divide it by the wavelength. So we can't divide by 650 because that's in nanometers. We need that to be in meters. Nanometers is 10 to the negative ninth meters. So you could change this to 6.5 times 10 to the negative seventh, but I just like to leave it 650 times 10 to the negative ninth. It makes my life easier. So when I plug that in, speed of light divided by my wavelength, I get 4.6 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds, 1 over seconds, seconds to the minus 1, or what that's called in the world of frequency is Hertz, HZ. Alright. So, as our packet kind of explains to us, life was good back then around the 1900, or I'm sorry, the end of the 19th century. Yeah, right around 1900. People were actually discouraging people from going into physics because <clears throat> they figured they had it all figured out. Matter and energy were very distinct. Matter was a collection of particles, while energy was a collection of waves. Well, then came along Mr. Planck, and here he came up with a relationship between energy and frequency involving H, which you see here is Planck's constant. And so, if you envision F is the lowest frequency of light that can be absorbed or emitted by an atom. So they were sending energy light energy into our atoms and recording what was coming back out of them. And so they discovered that it was coming out in these discrete packets, packets of energy, which is what HF multiplied together is. And they called that a quantum. And so a quantum of energy would either go into or out of an atom. And they noticed that these packets only came in whole number multipliers. Okay, it wasn't like 0.76 times HF or 2.89. It was discrete packets. And so you can, maybe your wheels are spinning. That's kind of how we figured out there's energy levels in an atom. Okay, so energy was being sent into the atom and it would only be absorbed in distinct amounts or it would only come out in distinct amounts representing transitions from distinct levels of energy, not just anywhere in the atom. So that was kind of a big important step and you see here that we now can say energy is quantized. So let's see a calculation. The blue color in fireworks is courtesy of copper one chloride heated up to about 1200 degrees Celsius. So the blue light comes out with a wavelength of 450 nanometers what is the increment of energy, the quantum that is emitted or associated with 450 nanometers? So again, we know that E equals Planck's constant times frequency. We don't have frequency, but remember we just saw that we can get frequency by taking the speed of light divided by the wavelength. And again, I like to say the wavelength, 450 times 10 to the negative ninth meters plug and chug, and ooh, just in time for Halloween, a little satanic frequency, 6.66 times 10 to the 14th hertz. All right, that's good, but we want the energy, so we have to take Planck's constant times our frequency, and so we get 4.41 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. And we already said joules is a very small measurement of energy. But remember, this is just for one packet of energy. Um, if we are going to use a significant amount of this substance, you're going to have a significant amount of electrons, you know, Avogadro's number and more. So when you multiply that fact by this amount of energy for one electron, then by yes, we can get some measurable amounts of energy. And then came Einstein. Okay, Mr. Einstein comes along. He was working as a clerk or something, had plenty of time to think, think, think. And he was trying to better explain the photoelectric effect. Again, if you want a more detailed um, description of that, Renee can tell you or Google it. But essentially, sending light energy in, onto samples of metal, you could get electrons to be ejected. 
and that would happen with different frequencies of light, but only certain frequencies would cause electrons to be emitted from certain metals, and so you can start to think, oh yeah, the electrons will have different amounts of energy depending where they are, so copper versus silver and gold, we should see different energies. And so Mr. Einstein said, okay, this quantum, it's a photon. All right, and so this photon is kind of like a particle. And, you know, here we have E equals HF, and of course F is speed of light divided by wavelength. And then Einstein came in and gave us E equals MC squared. So you could rearrange this and say, hey, our photons can have a mass. Planck's constant divided by wavelength times the speed of light. Very, very small, virtually massless, um, but there is mass. And again, this is where quantum physics and chemistry blur, and you know, I'm not here to say I'm the expert on this, but you know, typically we say a photon doesn't have mass, but not at rest, but they're always moving. Or eh, Again, I'm just trying to teach you a little bit of the history here and some calculations that could potentially be important to you. This is not a lesson in quantum physics. <laughs> All right. Um, but what we do get from this, and they did do, Mr. Milliken, Robert Milliken did an experiment. He gave us the mass of our electron with his oil drop experiment, and he also did kind of prove this mass of the photon. But now what we see here is the dual nature of light. It exhibits wave and particle properties. And so that is where we're at as far as that's concerned. Um, now, again, we're talking about everything traveling at the speed of light. So, Mr. de Broglie came in, and he was like, hey, what if something isn't traveling at the speed of light? And so we can have this little equation about the de Broglie wavelength for an object not traveling at the speed of light. It's Planck's constant divided by the mass of the object times its velocity. And so here it says, compare the wavelength for an electron with that mass traveling at that speed to a ball, like a baseball, that mass traveling at that speed. And so if you're going to compare these wavelengths, we're going to use the de Broglie equation, Planck's constant divided by the mass and the velocity, and we get these answers. And so you can see here that a little tiny electron traveling has a much much smaller wavelength so you would be able to pot potentially see the little particles traveling with a wavelength and a wave-like motion not the ball okay 1.9 times 10 to the negative 34th meters between the wavelengths that's hardly anything at all so like when a pitcher throws the ball to the catcher it's pretty much a straight line motion path Okay, yes, there is a wavelength. You could see an insignificant wavelength associated with it. But again, now we're getting more into physics, and I don't really want to do that. All right, I'm going to stop here. There's only a little bit left. Um, I believe right now we're, you know, we're on page four of the Rene packet. And so I'll make another small little video here that goes from page four to eight. All right, see you soon.